How good it is to worship the Lord together. Wasn't that great? Just singing to the Lord. It brings encouragement in our lives. Now go ahead and grab your Bible. You know that we're in Daniel if you've been with us. If not, grab your Bible. Everybody grab a Bible. Turn to the book of Daniel. We'll get there in just a sec. I want to just encourage you. Our church family and guests, you just kind of need to know this. We are continuing to be the church in these crazy days. Uh, we are filling the truck now as we're seeking to serve our friends down in South Texas. So you, you, you've seen that on Tuesdays. You can come by and we continue to use all that God has given us to share with those in need as an act of worship. Now, think back with me for just a moment. Back to January 1st, 2020. Or maybe you remember uh, 2019, December the 31st. Do you remember New Year's Eve? Uh, if you're like me, I remember I was with family, uh, some of our family that night celebrating the new year. But we were all looking forward to 2020, right? It's a new decade and uh, a 2020 vision. We're all moving towards this incredible year ahead. Well, now we know, we look back, and it was on January 9th that the Chinese state media uh, out of Wuhan, China, a place we'd never heard of, uh, said that there was a group of people, a small group of people who had pneumonia. These virologists and doctors uh, discovered that it was a result of this coronavirus, which is not new, but a new strand of coronavirus had shown up. And uh, we started to hear about this thing in February. In fact, I went back and I saw in March, first week of March, I was saying, hey, there's this coronavirus and it's serious. Uh, and being a global city like Dallas, uh, we're going to assume it's coming here. That was way back uh, four months ago now. Who would have ever dreamed we'd still be in this thing? And maybe the most challenging thing for many of us is that it sure looks like it's going to be here for a long time to come or the impact of it as we now think about this new normal. I think this is true. I think that this new normal is here to stay. Now, as the summer was approaching, in fact, months prior to the summer, we decided let's walk through the book of Daniel. The idea was, of course, that, hey, what is it, what is it like to live as an exile in Babylon? Okay, when you find yourself far from Jerusalem in a now post-Christian, many are saying, secular culture, how do we live as light and people of influence in that kind of a context? Well, here comes the coronavirus, right? So now, still talking about the new normal, but who knew that the new normal would be such a dramatic shift for us, such a crisis? Well, a crisis is not only a disruptor, a crisis brings about opportunity, right? Not only does it disrupt our lives, but a crisis also breeds innovation, and it's an accelerator. And that's what we're seeing in so many organizations, your business, here at the church. We're watching everything shift. And I've been so proud, so grateful for our entire team on how we've pivoted uh, so quickly. But we're going to continue to pivot. Count on it. We're going to continue to be creative as we move into this new year. Uh, here's the other thing we've talked about. On a personal note, a crisis like this uh, requires that we look hard at ourselves personally to say, hey, what is truly core in my life? What is it that doesn't change? You know, we talk a lot about what's core, what's not core. What is it that does not change and will never change? That is our focus in these days as we center our hearts on God. Now, at the beginning of 2020, as I think back on the, the, the beginning of the year, I challenged our staff team, our ministry team, to focus on a single word. Some of you have done this. On it. We've been doing this for several years. I challenge the team to focus on one word. With all the things you'll be doing or all the goals you're setting for uh, 2020, one word that will bring a white hot focus on your life and everything else will follow. Well, after a lot of conversations and lots of prayer in 2019 in particular, I was asking the question, um, what is success? You know, what is success in ministry? Or what is success? But even better, what is success in life? And, and I, I, I've talked about this publicly to some degree, but, but I, I determined that success in the end is a word, and the word is faithfulness. Now, my word for 2020 uh, is actually presence. Because as I thought about faithfulness, what does that look like? I determined it's coming before God in his presence and then being a faithful presence every moment uh, in every day. That will be success for me. Here's what I wrote, in fact, in my journal. I'll let you into my my personal journal. I wrote this. I will daily pursue the presence of God in every area of my life. His presence will be the goal and driving force of my life, relationships, and ministry. 
His presence is the destination and the pathway. I will continue my primary life's mission, which is inspiring grace, and I will live as a peaceful presence, watch this, in an anxious system. Little did we know. In order to be a healing agent of renewal, the greatest healing agent is the presence of God. Therefore, I will live in his presence, bring his presence, and operate out of his presence in everything I do. That, that has been my great charge. And then I wrote, I seek to be filled with his spirit and be a focused and faithful presence wherever he sends me and with whomever he places in front of me. Now, this still remains. Okay, in the new normal, the old normal is still faithfulness. Faithfulness before God Almighty. We trust a faithful God who's always faithful to us. And we come into his presence, allowing his presence to change our lives. And then we live a life filled with his presence. Now, I won't tell you that I've done that every single day uh, as well as I could. But that has been my hope and goal. And I've seen God do a great work in my life in this crazy season. Life, you see, in his presence ultimately is a life of influence. That's what I want to talk about today. I want you to turn to Daniel and we're going to look at Daniel chapter six. OK, now to place this in context, if you're with us, we keep keep kind of moving along at this point. Now, Daniel, I'll save you a lot of uh, lots of research because I was curious. Daniel's about 80 years old now. Um, he may be 80. We, we think 80 plus years in exile before he died. And in Daniel six, we pick up the story here and we're going to discover the secret to his success. Now, what I've done, uh, we're going to be looking at Daniel in the lion's den, maybe the most you know, famous passage in all of Daniel next week. What I've done is taken Daniel 6, broke it, uh, broke it up into two, two sections. We're going to look at the first, just 11 verses today, because this is the story behind the story. And this gives me an opportunity to step away, to look at Daniel's life out of one, one verse, really, we'll get to, and see the secret of his life. And then I want to make some applications on how we can become people of influence. Because becoming a person of influence, it, it, it goes like this. And here's where we're going to end up, okay? The birth of influence is prayer. The, the heart of influence is integrity. The key to influence is consistency. And the mark of influence is what I'm going to call empowerment, all right? So we're going to get back to all of those here at the end, toward the end of the message. But you're going to see all of these in Daniel's life. If you've been with us, you've already seen it. We're going to get to go behind the scenes and we're going to see the secret of his success. Kind of the proverbial um, iceberg, right? You only see the tip of the iceberg. They say some 90 percent or so is below the surface. Today, we're going to look under the surface and we're going to see what made Daniel so successful in his life. OK, so how do we live in a world? Uh, that is constantly shifting away from God in so many ways, living in exile. How can we be in the world, but not of the world? All right. In Daniel chapter six, again, I, I think he's been now in exile for about 66 years. He's in his late 70s, early 80s. If he got there when he was a young teenager is what we think. And many would expect now uh, Daniel would be probably a member of the BCC. OK, you would think he's like retirement age. He's at the Babylonian uh, country club. All right. Maybe the PCC. He's at the Persian now country club. He's enjoying retirement. He's he's chilling in his house on the Mediterranean. Right. Not even close. Daniel is continuing to serve the Lord and he's doing work that is not easy. Consider this. He's in politics. All right. I mean, he's in government, no less. Look at verse one. Here we go. It, it pleased Darius. All right. So Darius, let's let's capture this out of history. He's, he's subservient to Cyrus, who's actually the king. There were several Dariuses along the way. Now we have a Persian government that's taken over after Nebuchadnezzar. After Nebuchadnezzar, Cyrus and, and Darius, they, they waste no time getting uh, the whole country, the empire organized. We have all this historically and we see it here. Um, it was Darius to, to set up, it pleased him, to set over the kingdom 120 satraps. Uh, satraps were like, um, they're, they're provincial uh, leaders. We would think governors probably, okay? The word satrap literally means protector of the kingdom, okay? So think governors over states, if you will. Satrapies, they called them, provinces. So 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom and over them, three high officials of whom Daniel was one 
to whom these satraps should give an account so that the king might suffer no loss. Okay, so Daniel has risen to the very top, one of three key people in his cabinet, if you will. Now, later on, just a little bit of biblical history of what, what is real history here. In chapter nine, we see Darius is the son of Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus is also known as King Xerxes. You might know him out of another story, not unlike the story of Daniel, the story of Esther, who's living in exile and, and uh, faithful as well. So Darius is kind of like a prince at this point. Look at verse three. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was upon him. Okay, uh, another translation, an exceeding spirit. All right, that's another way to say that Daniel was next level. Daniel is next level. There's a spirit in him. It's the spirit of God. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. So anytime, watch this, especially if you are a believer in exile, and you're raised up to a position of leadership, I don't know if you've ever seen this, as a Christian, maybe, then others will come after you. Okay, that's exactly what's gonna happen. Here in verse four, then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful, there's the word, faithfulness, he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Check that out. His character ran all the way to the very core of his life. So look at verse five. Then these men, all right, conspiring against him, said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Now think about this. What would happen if your enemies, all right, whoever that might be, what if someone came after you uh, checking everything out to find out any kind of dirt they could find on you. They're going to check your bank account, see where you're spending money. Think about that. They're going to check your, your computer. They're going to see what websites you've been to. Check your phone. Where have you been? What have you been looking at? Where have you been going? We're going to check your, your text. Who have you been talking to? What have you been saying? Right? They're going to come at him uh, at his office. They're going to see if he's taken anything. Has he taken any paper clips that weren't his? They're looking for everything. How would you fare if your enemies came after you and said, we're going to take you down? Well, of course, that kind of makes all of us a little frightened. Uh, that's a little unnerving unless we're living our lives before God Almighty who does see all things and we're being faithful to him. But you see, people who don't worship the Lord, here's what happens often. We're going to find something about his God, his relationship to God. This is what I think happens to some Christians often. Hey, what about that random verse in the Old Testament? What do you believe about this? What do you think about this? And they'll go after maybe some character of our God or after scripture, something that is countercultural. We all experience this when we're in exile. It just means that you're following the Lord. Look at verse 6. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to king, to the king, and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. So let the flattery begin, right? Look at verse 7. All the high officials of the kingdom and prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors, that's like all the government officials, all agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any God for, or man for 30 days, except to you, O king, shall be cast into uh, the den of lions. Now, a couple things here. Historically, we noted the Babylonians were known to throw people in a fiery furnace, like legit, put them in a kiln, like pottery. That's real. Uh, we have history that, that, that backs that up. We also see that the Persians now were known historically to throw prisoners, how about this, capital punishment by way of being devoured by lions. We see this historically, we see it here happening uh, in the story of Daniel. We get to that next week. Now, what would you expect, think about it, a Jew to be doing? A devout Jew is going to be praying and they pray three times a day, even then towards Jerusalem. So let's, let's find something against Daniel they had this in mind. He's a strange monotheist and he's praying to this God of his. And so in verse eight, and think about this, 66 years later, okay, some odd later, after he gets there, he's still doing this. He's still praying. 
decades later, far from Jerusalem in his upbringing. He's continuing to follow the Lord. Look at verse eight. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed. Okay, so, it's, so it cannot be revoked, they're gonna say here. It, it's irrevocable. Therefore, King Darius signed the, the document an injunction, all right? So this is where the entire story hinges now on this verse right here. All this I want you to see in verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, He went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed, and here it is, gave thanks before his God. Here's the operative phrase, as he had done previously. Another translation, just as he had done before. This was his practice. This was the secret to Daniel's entire life. This is what's underneath the iceberg. The question I want to ask all of us here, does this describe your life? You see, and and, and too often when we run into stressful times, here's our pattern. We enter into anxiety or difficulty, conflict with with a coworker or a person or challenges in our family. We walk through the, let me ask you, what do you do first? What do you do first? First thing we often, you know, we come back. We want to prove that we're right. Uh, that they're wrong. We enter into conflict. We, we have these contrary opinions. When you enter into stress or anxiety, when, you, when you're watching what's happening in the news, what do you do? Do you go to your, your favorite news feed first? You go to your favorite cultural commentary uh, or com, you know, commentator and say, how should I think about this? You tell me. Or maybe you go to your favorite um, teacher, maybe a Christian teacher or pastor or, or, or a book or something. Oh, that's good help and, and such. But watch this. Daniel goes first to God in prayer. See, prayer should not be our last resort. It should be our first resort. This was the separator. This is why Daniel's next level. If you want to be next level, if you want to be a person of influence, then you're going to practice prayer in exile. And you're going to practice prayer first. But look, even if you pray, it doesn't mean that God's going to pull you out. Not all the time. And there's a reason for it. We're going to see it. But look at verse 11. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Now think about this. The question I want to ask here, and I'll ask it at the end. How do we want to be found? Man, I want to be found contending before God. I want to be found praying. I want to be found calling out to him to move on behalf of my family, on behalf of my life, to move in my church and among my friends. I want to be found contending before God Almighty. See, often in exile, God will, will say, hey, I will not rescue you out, of the, you out of this circumstance. We saw this with the fiery furnace, for instance. I'm going to put you in there and you're going to come out through the fire. You're going to be better for it and I'm going to receive glory. I'm going to keep you in that crazy position you find yourself in. Maybe it's a relational strain that you find yourself in and it will not end. Like you're in this for a long time. And God is saying, I'm going to keep you there because you're going to, if I pulled you out, then my presence would no longer be there. Friend, listen, stay the course. Next week, we're going to look at the consequences of this decision to follow God. And and, and we're going to have a great time looking at the uh, Daniel in the lion's den story, an incredible story. But here's what I want to do in the latter part of this message now. I want to talk about becoming a person of influence. This passage gives me a chance to step back and to first say this. The birth of influence is prayer. That's what we see here. I mean, we we live lives with purpose and courage if we're grounded in a personal walk and relationship with Jesus. Like Daniel, see, strength and power in public is forged in private and quiet moments in private. I'd say it this way, the source of influence publicly is born out of a life of prayer privately. See, personal intimacy with God, which comes through practicing prayer. We've we've had a whole series on this. You can find it on our website right there. Practicing the way of Jesus. When we practice the way of Jesus, then we find ourselves becoming a person of influence. And we're, we're, we're tied to, we're plugged into the power source. See, don't miss this. There's an unseen adversary in this story. Think about this and think about it in your own life. We, we so personify all of our challenges in people around us. There's an adversary. There's a real enemy. Is it really the satraps? 
Is it really Darius? It's the evil one. And Daniel knew this. This is why he's praying. You see, too often we're that way. We, we think, well, my trouble at work, that person, they're standing in my way. or That person is creating all this challenge in my life. That family member is driving me crazy or whatever it is. Listen, our battle is not against flesh and blood. Look at what it says in Ephesians 6, 2, uh, 6, 12. In fact, let's say this together. You can see it there. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, Uh, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of heaven, of evil in heavenly places. All right. So, so Ephesians 6, 12 tells us it's not flesh and blood. That's a person, right? It's the evil one. He's an accuser. He's an adversary. And that's what he's doing to Daniel. If you're living as an exile in Babylon, the accuser is going to come after you. So don't be surprised by it. Jesus said this would happen. This is why Daniel is praying first and why we need to pray because the birth of influence is prayer. Now look at this. Secondly, the heart of influence is integrity. Now everyone agrees that integrity is important. I mean, if you don't talk about influence, you want to read a book on leadership, everybody talks about integrity. Because if you're going to, ha- if you're going to be a leader, then you have to be trusted, right? If you're going to have a high trust culture in your organization, you've got to be a person who's trustworthy. That comes with integrity, right? So everybody is talking about integrity. But nobody is talking about where you get integrity, where it comes from. And the problem is we don't address the challenge that is, that is the challenge of all of us. We've seen it here in this, in, in this story of Daniel. The challenge is sin. I mean, it's what the Bible calls sin. It's pride, right? We saw it with Nebuchadnezzar. Why is it that so many people, when they're given authority and power, okay, influence, that they often just spin out? People of influence flame out because pride comes before the fall. Abraham Lincoln said this, Nearly all men can stand adversity. But if you want to test a man's character, give him power. And we see this in our day today. We see so many people put in powerful places and pride takes them down. And it's because God alone has ultimate power. And any influence he gives us, he gives us to be a conduit of his influence and his grace into the lives of others. So any influence that God gives us, and all of us are in places of influence, we must remain, we've talked a lot about this, we must remain humble before him. Now, how about this? Think about this. The word integrity comes from a Latin word. We get the word integer, okay? Integer is a, is a whole number, right? It's not a fraction. It's not fractured. So, so integrity means a person with integrity is whole, complete, um, not divided, right? Not fractured, Because friends, listen, here's the truth about us. This is what separates the Christian life from all other lives. We are broken. The Bible says we are fractured people, broken, if you will, into many places and pieces. God, who is whole and one, perfect integrity, Jesus embodied the perfect, holistic, fully human life. And, and he comes and lives the perfect life for us on our behalf. Because we couldn't. Broken and fractured. He lives it. And, and then he, he takes upon himself our sin, our brokenness upon himself. He becomes broken for us. He's, gone, he's taken to the cross and he dies on a cross. His body broken, right? Can't wait to have the Lord's Supper, communion with us again uh, someday. We break the bread We drink the blood because it reminds us that he is life. He is our sustenance. His body was broken for us. His blood was shed for us so that we might be made whole, that we might be complete in him. Friends, that's what it means to be a believer. Have you received Christ? Have you received that, that, that act of grace that he's extended to you by dying on the cross? If not, today is your day. You can't be a person of influence apart from having your heart changed to become a person of integrity. And I know many of us are thinking, well, Jeff, I'm not really in a position of leadership. Look, I'm not talking about positional leadership. You can be in a position of leadership and not lead. You can, you can be an influencer by the way that you live. Daniel rose to positions of influence, but it was because of his character. It was because of who he was. See, leading others to, to point them to Jesus to become better 
that is your place of influence. What is your sphere of influence? Because here's the thing, you, you can never be too old, never too young to be an influencer. Stacy and I had uh, a dinner moment with some friends this, this past week. And uh, we, we were with them talking about, uh, they were their grandparents, a little bit older than us, and, uh, and they're talking about their grandchildren. They have lots of grandchildren. And they were talking about their devotion, their commitment, their resolve to share the gospel with their grandchildren. Now, most Christian grandparents, if you're a Christian, you're probably thinking, oh, that's what I want to do. They, but they were, they were taking it this to another level. They were saying that, you know, often we, we give that over to the parents. Like we tried to teach our kids how to, how to raise their kids in the Lord. But instead they were saying, no, our resolve is the number one thing and, and priority in our lives in this time, this season, when many people are changing so dramatically as kind of empty nesters in their 60s, 70s, even in their 80s, and, and thinking my life is changing so much, how can I have impact? Listen, grandparents, don't underestimate the power that you have in the lives of your grandchildren. Share the gospel with them. Teach them about faith. Disciple them is what I'm saying. You empower them when you talk about how you came to Christ, how you deal with challenging moments and, and challenging times in your life. What if the number one goal in your life was not to reduce your golf score by a few, you know, few strokes or, or, or just hang out at your new place at the lake or, whatever, or travel? All that's great stuff. All that is wonderful stuff. What if your number one goal was to, was to share the gospel and all of its implications with your grandchildren? That's how you invest your life in these days. If you don't have grandkids, you find younger people. You come alongside them. This is discipling the next generation. Now, Daniel was a man of integrity because it all began with prayer. All right. Are you a person of integrity? Do you live that way? See, Daniel, the, the problem with many of us uh, was not his problem. The problem with many of us, we're more worried about our reputation than we are about our character. Listen, you take care of your character and your reputation will take care of itself. Daniel had impeccable character. He didn't have to worry about his reputation. See, again, in politics, no less. All right. And so listen, uh, and I got to say this, um, we're moving into an election year, right? I mean, we're in it and it's starting to ramp up. Let me just say it. Your political party is unreliable. Okay. It's fickle. And your ideological tribe is vengeful. And like Daniel, you've got to rise up to a higher kingdom. As believers, we're part of a higher kingdom. See, he followed this higher power and this higher kingdom, which is love and truth. All right. So truth and grace. And we're going to live that way as we move into this year. Now, watch this birth. The birth of influence is prayer. The heart of influence is integrity. Thirdly, the key to influence is consistency. That's what we see in Daniel's life. 66 years in politics, again, no less. He's in exile and, and he's living this life of integrity. For really seven decades, he's living it out. Let me ask you, are you a person of consistency? You say, well, you know, maybe I'm, well, I'm kind of young. How does, that, how does that play out? I mean, I've lived only so many years. Watch this, one day at a time. That's how it happens. Being faithful, there it is, faithful presence one day at a time, in the moment, wherever he places you. Are you living your life that way? Because a consistent life is a life of influence. Okay, then finally, the mark of influence is empowerment. All right, empowerment. Now, Daniel's influence is seen in those closest to him. We saw it earlier in, in chapter one when he's leading the way to say, we're going to resolve not to defile ourselves with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We see it again in chapter three uh, with the fiery furnace. We watch and see Daniel has empowered them. He, he's, he's, we, we call it discipled them, right? He's raising them up. And you say, well, well, well how, do you, how do you disciple someone? If I were to ask you, how would you disciple somebody? Some of us might go, I, I don't know. And yet that's our primary role as believers, to make disciples. How do I make disciples? Listen, it's this. Follow me as I follow Jesus. And so those in closest proximity with us, that's where we're teaching them how to follow uh, Jesus. And if you're a parent, okay, kids get a front row seat to watch and see you follow Jesus every day. And yes, through your challenges, through your trials, through, through your struggles, even when you mess up, to talk about God's word. How do you hear from God? Do your children know that, or hear you pray? 
Do they see you like Daniel praying? Show them how to follow Jesus every day. And now I want to make a, a, a comment here as we close our time. I want to shift as we end this time to John 17, because here's where we see a concept that really is all about the book of Daniel. And it's the words of Jesus. He's talking about being, if you've been in Christian circles very long at all, you've heard this phrase, to be in the world, but not of the world, right? And that's a great way to describe Christ's followers, in, but not of the world. But here's what happens. Over the years, I've seen this. In fact, let's look at Jesus' words first. Verse 14, I have given them your word. He's praying for us, by the way, before he goes to, it's the eve before his crucifixion. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Okay, so we're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Okay, so Jesus is being very clear. He's saying, they're not of the world, just as I am. He's not of the world, so we're not going to be of the world either. We're going to be like Jesus, right? But here's what many of us do. A lot of Christians get a wrong impression here. We, we, we think, well, we're not of this world, but we, but we really need to, uh, to just stay away from this world. So the starting place uh, of being in this unfortunate condition is that, well, we're, we're in the world, but we've got to bring all of our energies to not being in the world. And so there's this retreat from the world. And I see many believers see that and understand it that way. So the force is moving away from the world, right? Let's use all of our energy not to be of the world. Now, there's a place not to be of the world, certainly. But being not of this world isn't the destination in these verses. What I want you to see here is so critical as we think about the life of Daniel and living in exile is, is in verse 17. Look at this. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. All right, so we're going to be different. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. For their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in the truth. Now look at this. Look at the ultimate destination. Jesus says we're not of this world. But look at this. This is going somewhere. Jesus is not huddling up his team, pulling a team out, and then saying, let's all just sing songs together. You know, let's, let's go hide out and sing kumbaya, and then go back out, but don't be of the world. A lot of Christians live that way. I'd ask you, do you live that way? Trying to always retreat from the world. Now, this, we're not of the world, but instead what he's doing, like a quarterback, he's gathering the team. We gather, even as we are now, like this. Gather in order to get the play and to go and advance the ball down the court or down the field, right? Down, we, we are advancing the gospel. So in verse 18, he says, you are sent. So I want to rephrase this, all right? He's saying to us, to you and to me, we're not of this world, but we are sent into the world. Not of the world, but sent into it. Okay, so the accent falls on being sent, all right? With a mission, all right? So we've talked about that here. In fact, we've used this, this little graphic you can see here. Um, that we are exiles living in Babylon, okay? So we're to be in close proximity with others who don't know the Lord. Conversations, serving them, loving them to Jesus. And it's at that intersection where the kingdom of God shows up, where the Spirit of God moves. It's why He has you right where you are. He has you in that place to serve Him. You are not of the world, but you're sent into it. So look, 2020 hasn't gone as some of us have anticipated, but life never really goes as you have planned. And, and I've said that the one thing you can be certain about in this new normal is uncertainty. But today we're reminded that there is a faithful God who never changes. And this is the case again. We look at the gospel and we say, okay, what does this mean? I die to myself just as Jesus died. I'm raised up again to live in the world, to be sent in as one who's not of the world. I've died to myself, filled with his spirit, the presence of God in me as I go forth to be a person of influence. So as you go about your day today, as you go through this week, listen, remember that becoming a person of influence 
means that the birth of influence is prayer. The heart of influence is integrity, right? The key to influence is consistency. And the mark of influence is empowerment. You have been called to be a person of influence. Lord, let us be so. I want us to pray together. And earlier I challenged you, if you don't know the Lord, today is your day. You'll never be a person of integrity. You'll never be a person of influence until you give your life to him. So let me just lead us in a prayer. As we close our time, we're gonna to sing together. I just wanna, I want you to pray with me right now. Just uh, say, Lord, I, I'm yours. I, I give you my life. I want to be a person of influence. I want to be a person of integrity. I want you to guide my life as I, as I make prayer the priority of my life, walking with you daily. And friend, if you've never received Christ, now by faith, just say, Jesus, come into my heart. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I give you my life. Lord, I pray that you will use us all to your glory and to our great joy as we serve you to be people of influence, even in exile, as we move into this new normal. And Lord, we continue to worship you now throughout this week with our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.